As we said before, we're about 20 blocks away from the World Trade Center site, but we were getting some of the silt and debris uh, up here, this far away from the World Trader. Secondly, Peter, there is a, a much more uh, heightened activity from police cars, dump trucks, and other emergency vehicles now in the area. They're congregating about three blocks away and looking to, to go down towards the World Trade Center. We just saw three uh, police cars go by and other cars that were completely covered in, in dust and debris. Is Gary Breeze from the Firefighters Association still with us? Yes, I am. It's, I'm sorry, Peter. And I was just asking for Gary. Gary, do you know whether or not uh, number seven had been fully evacuated in the course of the last seven or eight hours? Uh, no, not not firsthand, but I can I can tell you that if it was possible to be evacuated, it would have been cleared out. Uh, you know, that, that's one of the first jobs that a firefighter will undertake is getting the civilians out of the buildings. And I think it's reasonable since they've had this much time and it wasn't terribly structurally damaged in the initial mm -hmm. blast. They probably got everybody out. Okay, Gary, thank you very much. And George, we'll let you all go back to working our sources in the minute. The, ma the mayor of New York, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, is going to have another uh, news conference uh, in, in a little while to now. And there's probably, there's no person in the city who has a better handle at this point on everything that is happening. Um, he was a little reluctant, understandably, to, to, to give some sense of magnitude uh, early on in terms of casualties, but he surely knew this was coming as, as we did. And while we are waiting for him, take a slight right turn here for the moment and talk to our aviation expert, John Nance. It's actually not a, it's not a right turn. It takes us back to the very beginning of this day. John, are you there on the phone? John Nance? Yes, I sure am. Peter, can you hear me? Um, yes, Peter, can you hear me? Well, I can indeed, John. And one of the things that just comes as, I think, a shock to people today is that for the most part we thought that uh, u.s airliners were if not immune from hijacking were far better able to handle such situations and we get three major aircraft on two major airlines in one day how, how is it possible peter I, I think we've all been aware in commercial aviation that no matter how we hardened up the system against the casual hijacker in other words the the metal case or somebody who uh, who really isn't terribly well organized We've always known that our vulnerability level remained very high for somebody who intended to commit suicide and who was determined to do a lot of planning to know exactly what to do and how to do it to break in. And I think that's what we have seen today. This is the type of threat that has been our worst nightmare uh, as commercial air crews and in the commercial aviation business because if we tried to harden our system against this, we'd get fewer than 20% of the normal air traffic in the air every day. What do you mean that by that? By harden the system against it, you'd only get 20% up every day. Well, Peter, we don't know exactly how these people got on board. We don't know what happened, but uh, El Al is a good example. They have not had an incident in a long, long time because they're extremely careful. The Israeli if you airline. travel with them, yes, correct. You, if you travel with them, you are going to answer questions. You are going to be very carefully looked at. They know who they carry, and that's one reason they've been so safe. But if we tried to apply that same level of security, to the entire civil air traffic system of the United States, we would cut down the amount of air traffic uh, by, well, down to one-fifth, and that's probably being conservative. Is it your feeling, John, that at the moment, I, I realize you can't say, agree to this wholly, given what's happened today, that the system is about as tight as the public will tolerate, given the extraordinary amount of air travel we do? That's well, an issue, right? I think right? we can do what we, yeah, it is difficult, but I think we can do what we do a lot better. Peter, but I don't think that uh, basically that we have a, a situation here in which we can get much more tight. Now, John, I think it was you. Lost or, 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 can you still hear me, John? John Nats can't hear me for a second, but while they try to, uh, while they try to reconnect us with him, because he's so good on this particular subject, I think it was John or earlier who said that the modern airplane, the 757 and the 767, were both involved today. Are, are such sophisticated aircraft in the cockpit that they're actually simpler to fly. And, and so it is, it is clear, John believed earlier, that whomever did this today on board the aircraft itself had to have some knowledge of how to steer a plane into a building. Because no one today has been able to believe that a commercial airline captain on a U.S. aircraft would not sacrifice his own life rather than fly his own airplane into a building full of people. John, I'm just reviewing, you back with me now? John Nance? Yes, I'm back with you. I'm just reviewing this yeah, notion you brought up earlier, I'm reviewing this notion you brought up earlier today, that someone who was determined to fly an aircraft into two buildings like this, three including the Pentagon, 
didn't have to be an expert yes. flyer to get at the controls. Explain again, would you? Well, I think anyone who has, in our terms, a licensed pilot, even somebody who flew a smaller airplane, could manipulate controls of a jetliner once it got in the air. The problem is that if you wanted, if you're doing the planning for something this heinous, and you want to make absolutely sure that all of your aircraft reach their targets, you're going to want to put pilots who have some exposure to this type of airplane, or at least this class of airplane, into those seats. And that's why I don't believe that uh, we had anything other than pilots that were put into this position, and probably the air crews, I'm speculating wildly, obviously, but I would imagine that the air crews that were assigned to those flights were probably killed very rapidly. So it would take a minimum of experience but some familiarity with a cockpit of a 757 or a 67 to do what was done today. I believe so, Peter, you know because, saying, again, you know, I, I, that is what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that you, any pilot could get into those cockpits with an airplane in flight and physically pull and push and turn and manipulate that airplane. But if you're planning this and you want to make sure that they do it right and they, they don't mess it up somehow, you're going to want people who have had exposure to that class of airplane. And that's where I think uh, we may end up seeing this investigation go. And I actually think, if I recall correctly, that many hours ago you raised the notion, you raised the possibility that someone who did this had some time in a, in a simulator. There is a high likelihood uh, that if you were going to plan this again over a period of time, a year or two, uh, that you could, if you were the planning organization, find a way to get your pilots that you want to train into a simulator someplace in the world. There are a lot of 757 and 767 training, or a lot of it available. And, uh, you know, our people train air crews from all over the world, our people meaning in the United States. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily have any clue of what was in their hearts or what they were planning to do if they came in the door from a legitimate carrier or even a private operator of a 757, because there are some private ones out there. Thank you, Josh. Anything else you need By to add? Way, the, please, go ahead. Yeah, just one other thing. I, this is an unusual situation, and one of the little flags in this, Peter, at this early stage is the fact that we're talking about only 757s and 767s. That is the only combination of big airplanes that have what we call a common type rating. In other words, if you're rated in one, you can fly the other. The cockpits are almost identical. And that may be of no consequence here. It may have simply been coincidental, but it also raises a little flag that maybe we are dealing with somebody who planned this on the basis of having trained for this type of airplane. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed, which uh, certainly speaks to the point that uh, any number of analysts of terrorism, somebody said this morning nobody wants to be described as an expert on terrorism today, as analysts of uh, terrorism and terrorism activity, and who try to monitor it around the world as effectively as they can have said, uh, this was uh, today a very sophisticated operation. We do know now, we believe, that about a hundred people are believed to have been killed or injured in today's attack on the Pentagon. And as John McCrethy from the Pentagon has said to us on several occasions, there is no guarantee that that is the final number. But currently the information from the Pentagon is that a hundred people are believed to have been killed or injured in today's attack. And you recall that Mayor Giuliani of New York, the closest he has come to, uh, to giving uh, casualty figures, which he's very understandably reluctant to do, that 2,100 people were injured, 600 taken to hospital, 1,500 walking wounded taken to Liberty State Park, which is on the other side of the Hudson River, actually in New Jersey, uh, where the Statue of Liberty, all this in full, full view of the Statue uh, of Liberty, um, and, that, and that various hospitals from New York City all the way to Canada are treating people today who have been somehow injured in this. Now, I want to talk to Lynn Schur, who has been following the, the aircraft all day. That is the American and United Airlines planes involved in these incidents. Lynn? Uh, as you well know, the only video that we've seen of an actual crash was of that second flight. That was the United flight that, uh, that crashed into the second World Trade Tower. What we're going to show you now is some very crude animation of the first flight. That was American Airlines 11. That's the flight from Boston to Los Angeles that went into the first World Trade Tower. What this is is animation based on the track of the plane, uh, data coming from the FAA. You're going to hear Walter Cross, the programmer, uh, describing it. Uh, the flight took an immediate hard left turn due south. Uh, the speed initially decreased 
uh, by over 100 miles an hour and then uh, increased to over 500. And then as it approached the New York area, it uh, slowed to uh, uh, all the way down to about 300 knots. So it's, and then tragically it impacted in the World Trade Center. American 11 was indeed the first flight, we have confirmed that, of the two. And that again, that was the voice of Walter Cross, the programmer who put that animation together. What that shows you is this flight on its way to Los Angeles headed due west and then made that very sharp turn. Mr. Cross also told us that there was an indication of some air violence right before that left-hand turn, violent changes in airspeed as the plane went off track to head into the World Trade Towers. On that flight, 92 people not counting the hijacker. And Peter, I've done some very quick calculations. Of course, all of the planes involved in today's incidents were headed to California. Uh, three of them to Los Angeles, one to San Francisco, two had left Boston, one from Dulles, one from Newark Airport. Total number of passengers and crew, 266 people, not, of course, counting the hijackers. Peter? Thanks very much, Lynn. And, and the, the, the issue of taking off from Boston and Dulles and all headed for, for California, John uh, Miller uh, raised the subject before, raised the issue before of whether or not, there well, lots of reasons, and again, we'd be speculating, but he makes the point that, that aircraft taking off from Boston and Dulles outside Washington to go to California would have full loads of fuel on them, thereby creating a far greater explosive potential without having had to have explosives on board and getting them past U.S. security, either at Dulles, Air, Air, at Dulles Airport or at, at Boston. 266 people on the aircraft alone today who have died in this attack on the United States and on the American people. Now, in our control room, somebody says there is a... Let me go first to Bill Blakemore and then perhaps to Joe Torres um, of WABC, our affiliate in New York. Bill Blake, were you there? And I gather you saw number seven come down. Yes, I did, Peter. I'm standing right on the West Side Highway. The skyline of the financial district has changed again. Just a few minutes ago, I was talking to some people. I was facing north. I saw a shock in their face, heard screams spun around, and then we just watched the building fall in on itself. I believe we have a little bit of tape here. That's, uh, Peter, it was uh, an astonishing thing because the, the civilians who were standing around here were all amazed, but things have become so bizarre down here that the hundreds of firemen who were standing around looked at it, felt a bit shocked, but then just said, well, we're going to have even more work to do. Uh, associate producer Lucy Kerrigan had been over near that building just a little bit earlier, and the policeman had told her that they feared the building was going to come down, that they were evacuating people from around it, so that's one little bit of good news is that there may have been fewer casualties from this latest collapse than there otherwise might have been because they knew of the potential. But it's now um, still a very hot day here. The uh, search and rescue operation is mounting even larger. There are dozens and dozens of fire trucks backed up on the West Side Highway, police trucks. There are what look like hundreds of volunteers who have showed up who have been marshaled by the Red Cross, all with masks to avoid breathing in dusk, but nobody can go in yet. We're still looking at buildings that are on fire down in the center of the financial district, and it's clearly a great deal of devastation. It's uh, not too strong a word at all. It's going to take a while even to assess how bad it is. B Bill, do you have any idea whether or not other buildings in the immediate area are vulnerable at the moment, whether there's concern about any other building as there was about this additional one after the towers? Well, from the angle I'm looking at, um, we can see one other building still on fire, and it seems to be on fire through the length of it. I would estimate that's like a 30 or 40, about a 30 or 40 story building. Uh, the problem for any one of us, of course, is that because of the other buildings down here still standing, which are so tall, you can't get a very clean view of the whole thing from the ground. But there's at least one, and it's clearly uh, going to go on into the night. There's a lot of black smoke pouring out of that building now. Thank you, Bill. Just, we just stay with this photograph for this graphic for just a second. Well, no, there's number seven coming down. When you think that, that, that uh, part of the component of news coverage around the country every year is the excitement 
and the fun that people get watching an old building being demolished and they wired very carefully for days and it's a very careful operation in order to make sure that the building comes down safely i think the last one we saw was when they brought down one of the old casinos in las vegas i mean this is just stunning to see these things come down inside in the case of the two the north and south uh, towers there of the World Trade Center, you know, come down within a couple of hours as a result of the structural damage, weakening that was done when these aircraft hit them. And now, number seven, the World Trade Center, which is, which is 47 stories tall. We're talking with the World Trade Center north and south, 110 stories tall. Um, an eerie experience to be in them at, at the best of times. They sway in the wind and. and and, and people uh, and long had experiences with them but but those and as bill blakemore said just a moment ago the 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 landscape of new york city has changed one again and in this instance it's not new york city it's not new yorker cities it's everybody in the country city at this moment because this was an attack on these on the united states no question about it everybody said it all day a declaration of of war an act of war against the united states we've had a number of politicians and commentators us included who were reminded that the last time there was an attack like this on the united states was pearl harbor which in which finally induced the united states to get fully involved in in world war in world war ii and we're going to go on all day and we'll continue throughout the night trying to get some grasp of this what do we know at the moment the president is on his way back to washington uh, and uh, we, we're not certain whether he's going to be helicoptered in from Andrews Air Force Base, which is tradition. But the security apparatus is concerned, and so he may come in a motorcade. I can't remember the last time a president went to, went or came from Andrews Air Force Base in a, in a motorcade, even a president. Maybe the last time was Bill Clinton. No, I don't even think Bill Clinton at the end of his inauguration went out. But, but there's another example. And the president wants to speak to the nation. And Linda Douglas reports from Capitol Hill that that the uh, that the leadership in Congress today tonight <coughs> wants to have you have who on the telephone I didn't know that I did not know that I apologize thank you first time I've heard about it judge Webster yes, Peter. I'm sorry sir I didn't know you were on the phone no, this it's is... been very interesting and I'm, I'm glad to listen thank you sir this is judge William Webster the former director of of the FBI on the phone one of the country and, and, and the CIA as well, as, as my friend John Miller points out. Judge Webster, I, maybe you could help us understand many things, but at, at the outset, when this happened today, does this overwhelm the FBI and drive the CIA, CIA into some kind of turmoil at the same time? When it happened today, is that your question? Yes, sir. Uh, it seemed to me that they responded uh, quickly. Uh, the FBI's uh, emergency uh, operations centers were in place. Uh, CIA, of course, is going back to its uh, to its intelligence and uh, see what uh, what they had, what they didn't have. Uh, I think what you usually find in a situation like that is grim determination to do a good job. I don't think it's any kind of uh, frustration or uh, frenzy. And as you have watched these events unfold today and perhaps even talk to your colleagues, your former colleagues in the FBI and the CIA, what's your appreciation of this as a whole event? Well, it's an extraordinary event, and it, uh, it brings uh, home what we've been saying about the change of terrorism in the last 20 years, as it moves from fewer numbers, mm. uh, trying to uh, make a political point to uh, doing extreme damage uh, and uh, this reached a high level of capacity to do damage in that way, and it needs to be addressed as such. Uh, when you think about what has happened today and the tremendous uh, tragedy and calamity, uh, it didn't involve nuclear weapons, it didn't involve biological weapons, uh, it didn't involve equipment, artillery, scuds, or anything. It involved the ability to steal four or five airplanes uh, and to uh, and to send them on a course of destruction. Uh, that's within the capacity of non-governmental organizations uh, such as the kind you've been talking about. And do you believe, Judge Webster, because there's a lot of <clears throat> armchair observation today, and I don't mean to include you in that, a lot of armchair observation from many of us, do you believe that this in any way, shape, or form could have been prepared for, if not prevented? You'd like to think that you could prepare for every kind of calamity, but you also like to think that we live in a society that we're very proud of in terms of the freedoms we enjoy, and the freedoms to travel is one of those. Uh, freedom from, uh, from uh, violence is another one to the extent that we can know about it. 
knowing is the difficult thing. It's, in, in my years of experience, terrorism was the most difficult because of the cellular nature, cellular nature of uh, decision-making at the top. Even the people who were in the organization would not know until the last minute what was going to take place. I hope we can develop uh, better means of uh, profiling the kinds of, uh, of, of uh, people who could do damage. And I'm not talking about highway racial profiling. Or anything. I'm talking about looking for people that fit profiles of, of behavior. Uh, that would be more helpful. As I listen to you say that, Judge Webster, I think about Timothy McVeigh. Nobody had Timothy McVeigh down as a profile. No, they didn't. <laughs> in, they had... in Oklahoma City. And many of the profiles we do seem to be the obvious ones. Uh, yep. you know, pick on a member of a developing nation because the nation is antagonistic, or the group because it's antagonistic to the United States. I mean, is this the most efficient way to do it? No, no. I think uh, that was just one of the things that we're trying to say, should, do, should we tighten up? It's not clear to me that we don't know enough yet to draw any firm conclusions about whether or not people were able to w walk on board those airplanes with weapons that pass through the screening devices. We just don't know yet, and we shouldn't draw conclusions about that. But I think we have to, we have to be sure that we have done everything we can to know in advance. Getting there before the bomb goes off is the ultimate objective. And uh, it requires a lot of cooperation now internationally. We have to share information with uh, our friends around the world about movements of people who are believed to be bent on violence. It's, it's a very tough assignment, uh, and it's one in which we can see now we're going to have to have uh, tighten our, uh, our belts because I think, again, when the uh, reports of the... The, uh, the, the casualties is finally released, it's going to be a lot more than anybody expected and probably uh, will be more or at least approximate the size. We haven't had anything like it since Pearl Harbor. Judge Webster, I don't mean to make you the target of criticism today. It's not my intention at all. But as I listen to you talk about we've got to tighten our belt and our defenses, it, it's what we hear after almost every incident of terrorism. And I wonder what you think as you've listened and watched today what you think more could be done that the United States hasn't been doing up until now that is humanly possible in a free society? I think we've been, I think we've been very educated and sophisticated in knowing what we needed to do. The counter-terrorist counter centers that have been formed to be sure that information is properly recognized and passed along to the people, those are things that can, in an evolutionary way, can be improved. Human intelligence, of course, is what everyone will call for now, and we should have it. Uh, but we shouldn't fool ourselves that it's something we can automatically take off the shelf and put in place in terrorist organizations. At the, to at the time that human intelligence, human you call it in your trade, was, yes. was, was downgraded as part of the national effort against terrorism, were you supportive of it being downgraded? Now, actually, that was before I came on board. It seems to me that we've been trying ever since 1978 to improve, uh, or at least 1980, to improve the quality of human intelligence. And in some cases, we were very successful. I recall the the ability in the Armenian terrorist incidents in the early 19, late 1970s and 80s, we were able to get there and interdict the bombs, one in San Francisco, one in Los Angeles, uh, one uh, with explosives en route to New York, and the other in Canada. Uh, we know what we need to do, and in some cases we can do it, but we're dealing with some very, very powerful and sophisticated competition here. Judge Webster, I just have, I'm very grateful you joined us. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but I have one more question for you. Whenever there's, a, whenever there's a debate or a discussion about the freedom of Americans and the freedom of movement Americans should enjoy under these circumstances, the director of the FBI is always right there at the center. And there's always a debate that there's always an inclination to think that you and the FBI, you want to make it tougher for Americans to move about because it's easier for you to do your job under those circumstances. What's your message to the American people today about retaining their freedoms in the face of this kind of enemy? I think the message is that we can't have a pendulum swinging back and forth from repression to uh, anarchy. And I think we've done a pretty good job of finding that center, which uh, Edmund Burke 300 years ago called ordered liberty. Mm -hmm. We need to have liberty, but it has to be one accompanied by order. And professionals are very willing to do their job under court orders and the appropriate procedures. All that they ask is that they not be unduly burdened uh, by uh, restrictions that, that in, in times like this get in the way of finding the culprits and bringing them to justice. Judge Webster, thank you very much for giving us the time. We'd like to hear from you later on. So. 
we're very grateful to you at the moment. Thank you. Two things the judge said. Thank which, you, Peter. You're welcome, sir. Uh, two things uh, the judge says which just leap off the page, John Miller, to me. Clearly, one is the Edmund Burke quote when he talks about liberty. It has to be ordered liberty. And the other, in terms of talking about the capacity of the terrorists, today said there were no scuds involved. There was just the capacity to steal four planes. And we had talked earlier about airline security. How do you get a gun on an airplane? Um, unconfirmed reports from these cellular phone calls that were made to 911 from one of the flights uh, saying that uh, a flight attendant had been stabbed. Uh, perhaps they didn't have a gun. Um, certainly, the, uh, the GAO and the General Accounting Office of right. Congress uh, and the FAA and uh, airline securities consultants have demonstrated over and over again that uh, if you're careful enough and you plan it, you can get a weapon onto a plane. And they've demonstrated exactly how, which I won't describe here for obvious reasons. Right. So um, this is security that's designed to harden the target, the airplane. Um, certainly, uh, there's no such thing as total security there. And terrorism, I mean, if you look at this most incredible, unprecedented, historic act of terrorism, mm -hmm. it still harkens back to what we see in the World Trade Center, Oklahoma City, the embassy bombings. Uh, we talk about the level of sophistication in planning, maybe, but the actual act is usually very low tech. A bomb made of uh, fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer and fuel oil, things you can look up and buy on the internet, uh, hijacking an airplane, uh, perhaps even with sharpened instruments. Um, now, the aspect that there may have been people trained to fly these planes, mm. that's a new wrinkle. That is a uh, Certainly on, on conventional hijacking. I can give you an update from the scene as please, things are developing please. there. Um, if there can be any good news about a day like today, the collapse of Seven World Trade Center, the building they were so worried about injuring rescue workers, has freed up um, rescue workers to now go into the area. And they are moving in in groups of 20 and 50 as their teams are designated. Um, so the, the principal danger, the principal danger to the rescue and recovery the, teams has been eliminated. The so biggest danger has literally removed itself. Right. Um, one of the first teams going in is uh, a team of tow trucks, which is literally going to pull uh, rigs that are uh, fire trucks, police trucks, that are buried in rubble out of the way so that they can clear a path and bring in other vehicles. And uh, they've requested uh, a number of dogs. Additionally, 100 the doctors... Distance. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Sure. Explain why they want dogs. Um, they, uh, they want bloodhounds, cadaver dogs, the kind of dogs that can climb up in the rubble with them and, and catch the scent of people um, that they can dig for in such a, such a big pile of rubble. It is a strange name for a specialty, but there are indeed things called cadaver, cadaver dogs. Anybody who call it the Condit investigation know that they were used in, and et cetera. Go on, right. please. Uh, 100 doctors, 100 nurses are, are standing by. Uh, the main police facility that is now the command post for the NYPD, not police headquarters, but a, an off-site location further up in the Midtown, um, has them standing by waiting for, the, for somewhere to send them. And uh, essentially, this, uh, this long operation, uh, which will be the longest night for New York's rescue workers, has just begun. And thank you, John. Cynthia McFadden, uh, I believe, is now at Chelsea Piers, a large sports entertainment complex on the west side of Manhattan, or at least close to it, which, Cynthia, I, is, was described earlier as a makeshift morgue. Is that really what it's going to be? No, it's not, Peter. What they've decided to do here is make this the triage center. We've been told that all victims now who are taken out of the blast site are going to be taken here first. They'll be tagged before they got, get here, uh, determine what the severity of their condition is, and then once they arrive here, uh, it'll be, they'll be treated initially and then sent on to other hospitals. I should also tell you that inside this has been described to me, I, you can see behind me, uh, ambulances. What you can't see probably is that there are probably 200 or 250 ambulances lined up here on the west side highways uh, waiting. These are empty ambulances waiting to distribute patients or potential victims all over the tri-state area to hospitals. Uh, Peter. Inside, uh, it's been described, we, we got a look inside earlier, it really looks like a MASH unit. It's 50 operating suites set up, hundreds of doctors and nurses here to treat the wounded. They have been here, standing here for hours now. There are no patients here yet. Uh, the latest estimate is that there won't be any people here for several more hours. 
Mm. What we're told is, and I was just listening to John Miller, uh, part of the problem initially was that when the first rescue workers went in, and we've talked to some of them who have, some, some of the second wave of rescue workers, the first wave of rescue workers who went in were trapped, many of them killed by the second blast. Yeah. And so when the second workers came out, many of whom are now here, um, uh, they, they wouldn't allow anyone back in the area, which is why there aren't any mm. patients here at the moment. Well, I, I, Cynthia, let me just go a little farther with that. You say 250 ambulances are standing around waiting to pull people out. You'd be talking about pulling people out of the rubble at this point. Yeah, the mayor said, the mayor reminded people across the country, there are 170 hospitals in New York City, and aside from St. Vincent's, the principal nearest hospital, <coughs> which lost, among other things, its emergency power, I think, and lost its gas operating facility at the time, wasn't it, John? Uh, that was uh, Beekman Downtown or New York Infirmary that right. lost its steam power. Uh, St. Vincent's then actually had to bear the brunt of this. And, and so the people have gone directly to hospital. I don't quite understand, C Cynthia, the, the who's going to come to Chelsea Piers unless until they begin to rescue people, hopefully, from the rubble itself. Peter, the, the initial thought, and of course, as you know, we've we've been to we've been to Bellevue today, a couple of other places. There have been hundreds of people at area hospitals, as you note, but they don't believe that anywhere near the full weight of this has yet been uncovered. That there are, are hundreds and thousands of people who have been injured in this blast, and that's the people that they expect to bring here. Okay. The, I... St. Vincent's is saturated at this point. They're intending, now, whether this happens, but the emergency medical services that's running this medical operation intends to bring no more patients directly to hospitals. They will all be brought here first for medical attention and for triage out to other hospitals. This is a Channel 10 News special report. America under attack. Good evening. If you're just joining us here on Channel 10 News, the World Trade Centers, as I'm sure you must know by now, in New York City are no longer standing, and the Pentagon has been heavily damaged after terrorist attacks this morning. Let's begin our coverage with Kelly Cobiea at our breaking news desk with word of one, at least one, South Florida victim. Kelly? And Christy, her name is Sonia Popolo. She is a socialite in her 50s, spends half of the year in the South Florida area, half of the year in the Boston area. Let's go to some video. She was on board the very first flight that went into the World Trade Center Tower. That was American Airlines Flight 11. Also on board that flight was a flight attendant who contacted American Airlines uh, Operations Center telling them that two of the flight attendants on board had been stabbed and that the attacker had made his way into the cockpit. This, of course, before the plane went into that tower. Again, Sonia Popolo was on board that flight. She was a very well-known socialite in South Florida, made her way to many events, donated a a lot of money her husband a financier in the boston area uh, we understand from her daughter who was very emotional today that she was on her way to visit her son in los angeles on board that flight uh, channel 10 reporter daisy Oliveira, also an editor at the spanish spanish language society magazine selecta knew sonia popolo and she talked about her with us today sonia was very very dynamic um, much much younger than her 50 odd years very involved in the community, very involved in anything cultural, anything to do with the arts. Okay. She was originally from... Puerto she was born in Puerto Rico. She was born in Puerto Rico, and uh, her husband is a, a businessman in Boston, and they lived half the year in Massachusetts, in Dover, and half the year here. Her son, one of her, her younger son, lives in Beverly Hills, and they would go there quite a bit. And Popolo's daughter, from what we understand, is in Massachusetts. She was notified by American Airlines today that her mother was, in fact, on board that flight and that she did uh, pass away. So, again, one of the very first, I'm sure, victims from South Florida involved in this terrorist attack in New York. From the breaking news desk, Kelly Kobie at Channel 10 News. And political reporter Michael Putney has been following the developments from about this terrorist attack all day long. He joins us now to talk about the devastation. I don't even know where you can begin to talk about this. Well, let's begin with that word, devastation, Christy, because that's exactly where we should begin. That's what happened today. And the devastation is psychological as well as physical. Today, I think we all suffered a blow to our sense of well-being, to our security, to the notion that we are invulnerable. The war on terrorism is now being fought on our soil. And as we're following that situation, we're just getting the latest developments. These are pictures from CNN. Apparently, there has already, Michael, been some retaliation. You're looking at pictures of bombing. We understand this is Kabul, Afghanistan. Let's listen in. 
Rockets perhaps going at the speed of uh, several hundred miles an hour, the sort of speed that one might expect to see uh, cruise missiles traveling across the horizon at burning with a, a, a white glow coming from their tails rather than, rather than a yellow glow. The fire on the uh, horizon that we can see from here burning furiously now. Uh, perhaps it would be accurate at this stage to suspect that that was a fuel dump that's been hit uh, by the way that it's burning, flames leaping, and that fuel dump must be perhaps five to eight miles from where I am. Flames leaping up from that fuel dump now, leaping up right into the air. Um, it was a low-burning fire before, but it's now really increased in its ferocity, perhaps indicating that it is a fuel dump. Looking across the rest of the city, uh, that fuel dump, perhaps the only big fire we can see at this time. From our vantage point here at the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel that overlooks the whole of the city of Kabul, that is in a basin surrounded by mountains, uh, the, the whole city is laid out in front of us. The gunfire that was coming up from the city seems to have subsided for now. We're not hearing any more detonations at this moment. And as I say, the fire on the horizon really burning uh, furiously at this time, flames leaping way up in the air this moment. Joey? Nick, if you can talk to us a little bit about your circumstance. It is 6 o'clock in the evening here in Atlanta. It must be quite late at night there in Kabul. Indeed, 2.30 uh, in the morning uh, here, Joey. We're eight and, a, eight and a half hours ahead of East Coast time in the United States. Uh, and it was about uh, five hours ago that the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan, Ahmed uh, Wakil, Ahmed Mutawakil, briefed journalists. I hear more detonations going off now. Um, he said that the Taliban had not taken precautions against uh, the like against the possibility uh, of there being an air attack against Afghanistan he said because it was not necessary uh, the Taliban spiritual leader Muller Omar had also made a statement saying that they felt Osama bin Laden wasn't responsible for what had happened in the United States he said his country was a peaceful country he wanted it to be at peace and he wanted uh, peace in other countries around the world certainly what we're seeing in Kabul, uh, in these early hours of this Wednesday morning, it is very far from peace. Uh, certainly, multiple explosions happening in and around the city. We, there is a front line uh, about 50 miles north of the city where the uh, Taliban are fighting a, a battle against the, uh, the Northern Alliance here. We could hear detonations coming from that uh, northern area as well. But on the perimeter of the city, particularly in the direction of the Kabul airport, which is about five to eight miles from where we are, detonations coming from there. I remember standing on this balcony about four years ago watching, uh, watching fighter jets bomb that airport as part of Afghanistan's ongoing civil war. The uh, flash uh, at the airport to us hearing the detonation at the hotel is about the same duration, so I, I am using that as an estimate uh, to gauge that those missiles again are falling in the area of the airport. First we're seeing the flash and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from it. There is still uh, a and lot of And there you're flashing. listening to CNN's uh, Nick Robertson describing an air attack in Kabul, uh, Afghanistan. Michael, does that indicate that the United States believes that Afghanistan had something to do with what happened I, in New York? I, absolutely. This looks like cause and effect. We should uh, explain to people, if you don't know, in Afghanistan, the ruling government is called the Taliban. And uh, two to three years ago, the Taliban was giving shelter to Osama bin Laden. And clearly, our intelligence community believes that the Taliban bears some responsibility. We did not hear the CNN reporters say that these were American warplanes. I can only assume that they were American warplanes, probably flying someplace out of the Mediterranean that uh, staged this attack on Kabul. Anyway, what we are seeing, if I can continue where we were before, what we are seeing is that there is retaliation and the war on terrorism is now being fought uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan, but more to the point, the war on terrorism is being fought on American soil, and that soil tonight is stained with American blood.
The first target, the twin towers of the World Trade Center, symbols of American might and commerce. At 8.45 this morning, a United Airlines 767 hijacked after taking off from Boston was crashed into the North Tower. At 9.03 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11, en route to Los Angeles from Boston, was flown into the South Tower. A tragedy of almost unspeakable dimensions was unfolding. Trapped inside the upper floors of the 110-story towers, people waved for help. For virtually all of them, there would be none. Down below, it resembled a war zone. Firefighters, police officers, and emergency medical technicians rushed to the scene, working feverishly to find and rescue the wounded. We lost power in the elevator. Thank God we kept the one of the truck guys there, and he forced the door, and then we worked our way down the stairs. As we came down the stairs, we were just dragging people along with us. At 9.58, the tragedy was compounded. The first tower collapsed. Authorities tried to rush people away, fearing the second tower would also fall. At 10.28, it did. I was standing next to one World Trade Center, and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling, and we all started running away from it. The glass, like, blew out and threw me onto the sidewalk, and I, I couldn't see for, like, 20 seconds. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. We just come out of Tower 1. We're walking towards Broadway. They're saying, move along, move along, move along. I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up. I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was just black everywhere. I can't even look at it because all I can see are people. I don't see a building. I see people. People hurt. Children without mothers and fathers tonight. In Washington, phase two of the attack, a little after 10.30, an American Airlines flight out of Dulles Airport was hijacked and flown into the Pentagon. ABC's John McWethy described what he saw. Uh, it appears that a large jet aircraft, uh, perhaps the size of a large passenger plane, came uh, very low, clipping off light poles as it approached the Pentagon. It slammed into the side of the Pentagon and it drove itself from the outer ring all the way to the inner ring. The attacks were denounced by PLO leader Yasser Arafat. My condolences for President Bush, for his government, for his uh, American people. And by British Prime Minister Tony Blair. This is not a battle between the United States of America and terrorism but between the free and democratic world and terrorism. President Bush, who had been visiting a school in Sarasota early this morning, boarded Air Force One and flew to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Er. And freedom will be defended. Er. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. From Louisiana, the president flew to a military base in Nebraska. At this hour, he is en route back to Washington, and the White House says he will address the nation tonight at 9 o'clock. And again, to take another look at the latest development, let's take a look at those pictures from Afghanistan, where explosions lit up the early morning sky in Kabul, Afghanistan. Can we look at those pictures that we had from uh, CNN? There you see the attack. An air attack. Now, again, we don't have any confirmation on whether uh, United States planes were involved. We are waiting on, on that information. In fact, a CNN reporter did report that there were missiles flying across the city, apparently large incoming missiles, and we're seeing here the results of those missiles in Kabul. Perhaps the president, when he addresses the nation at 9 o'clock tonight, will tell us more about I'm what I'm sure happened. he will explain 
what they are doing and, and why and what steps we, you know, this will, country will take next. I think America expects that there will be more steps to be taken. And air travel across the United States has been grounded since the incident and will remain that way at least until tomorrow at noon. At Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, passengers bust off the airport property as Broward Sheriff sealed off the entire area. PSA also brought in bomb-sniffing dogs to comb the airport. There you see some of the passengers and they were basically dumped off the airport property. They had to wait on buses to take them someplace for additional transportation. We're told that 580 flights in and out of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International were, were canceled today and of course all flights across the nation are grounded at least until noon tomorrow. In Similar scene at Miami International Airport. In fact thousands of passengers were left stranded there. Most have been put in hotels we're told by the airlines. The federal government says air travel can resume tomorrow at noon. And when the news broke, the emergency operations center in Broward was placed on level one activation. That's the only time it's happened before. The only time it's happened before was actually when there was a hurricane threatening our coast. Well, let's go to Channel 10's Matt Lorch. He's live at the Broward EOC in Plantation. What's going on there, Matt? Well, Dwight, they are breaking down now here at the Broward EOC after a state of emergency was declared at 10 o'clock this morning. In the meantime, Broward rescuers are now mobilizing, some already heading north. We can access any types of pipes or culverts, uh, again, any type of void that we need to, to get into or gain access to. Broward rescuers show off their snake eye camera. We could drill or access them through a small hole, make a search with that particular camera. Specialty equipment designed to find if victims not, trapped yeah. beneath heavy rubble. It's a very small camera. It's about an inch, inch and a half in diameter. There's several different tips that can be placed on this uh, apparatus to gain different access. The equipment and eight members of Broward's urban rescue team got the call early this morning. They're now bound for New York and Washington. They are currently on the road with uh, all the equipment that they take, basically be self-contained uh, to when they get there, go right to work trying to help uh, free these victims that uh, are obviously uh, within a lot of the rubble that we've seen on TV. And he is a very good dog. Soon to be sniffing out the living, Arco, a German shepherd belonging to BSO, ready to be called into action. I'll be supervising four live search and rescue dogs whose purpose is to go out and find the victims so that our technical search personnel can move in, verify their location. Broward's Emergency Operations Center breaking down late tonight after a day of governmental closures, state of emergency declarations, and rumor control. I am in the process of issuing the press release. And at 12 midnight tonight, they expect to resume normal county operations. That means all county workers, you are expected to return to work first thing tomorrow morning. As for the state of emergency, it is expected to be lifted at 12 noon tomorrow. And that's when the airport and the seaport here in Broward County are expected to reopen. That's the very latest from Plantation. We're live. Matt Lorch, Channel 10 News. As many of you are arriving home and, and seeing the pictures of the devastation collected throughout the day, you're wondering, well, what can I do to help? Well, one of the best ways that you can help is by donating blood. Now, many sites across South Florida are holding blood drives for victims. Diane Magnum is live at Mount Sinai Medical Center on Miami Beach with details on how you can help. Diane? Well, Christy, I've just finished donating blood. I want to tell everybody at home it is a painless process, and if you do want to get involved in a positive way, this is the best way to do it. South Florida has responded phenomenally. The first place we told you about at the Aventura Mall this afternoon was packed from the pennies through the mall out to the parking lot. So many people there that many came here to Mount Sinai Hospital, one of 12 locations set up by the uh, community blood centers of South Florida, joining forces with Magnum Force so people here in South Florida can be involved in a positive way. We've talked to so many people here this afternoon, all of them waiting in line a minimum of two hours, not one complaining about that wait, each one with their own reason for being here. So emotional and like there's nothing that I could do physically except for come out here and, and donate blood to people that, you know, absolutely need it. My brother's in New York, thankfully he's okay, but if he wasn't, I'd, you know, might as well be here donating blood. At least if we could do something, you know, that's all we really cared about is if we do something to help a little bit, you know, obviously some people are going to need some blood. Leaving this bandage on for four hours, eating a healthy meal afterwards, very easy to do, very simple to make a big difference to the people in the Northeast tonight. There are, as I said before, more than a dozen locations around South Florida. For a list of those locations, the best thing you can do, call our Magnum Force hotline, the number appearing on your screen in just a moment. There you go, 305 
7372-9911 in Miami-Dade County, 954-838-9922. If you can't get out today, the center's open from 10 to 10 today through Saturday. It is the best way to get involved. Back to you. All right, Diane. Well, many people are just trying to make some sense out of what has happened today, and they're turning to religion and to their faith to get through the crisis. Glenna Milberg is live at the Archdiocese of Miami and Miami Shores, where a number of people were gathering to offer their prayers tonight, Glenna. And that is because there is a special service called here at 7 p.m. It's one of many called at churches and synagogues tonight around South Florida because we, as a national community, are feeling this profound sense of grief and confusion, and so many people are turning to God, maybe not for answers, but for for some comfort. And what we are seeing tonight is a blending of prayer and patriotism. It is in times like this that people of faith are aware of the need for prayer. I ask that all people remain calm, placing their trust in God. And with profound grief, confusion, and helplessness, many don't know where else to turn. As much of South Florida closes, the churches and synagogues are open to prayers and counseling. As the day went on, it became more real, and more and more people became emotional about it. We've seen people crying and even, you know, really feeling a sense of lack of control, this fear for their children, the calling here, taking kids out of school. Throughout the Jewish community, that heightened concern as well. For instance, Temporal Israel of Miami is on the city's special intelligence services list for police protection in questionable times, as is the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. We immediately mobilized a staff.